Hello and welcome to the Econ Buff Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Stitzel. With me today is our favorite guest, Dr. Rex Pieski. Rex is a professor of economics at West Texas A&M University. Rex, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So, Rex, uh, today's topic is a speech that Argentinian President Javier Millet gave at the World Economic Forum. And it's interesting because, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm no history buff, we're, this is an interesting point in history because we don't see like real deal economists being civic leaders, um, much less ones that will then go on and, and kind of say the things that we see him say. Um, so kind of tell us why this speech that he gave at the World Economic Forum is so important and interesting to us. Well, it's, it's, it, the, the speech interests me and Malay interests me because as, as you say, he's he's not someone who studied economics. We've had lots of world leaders that have studied economics. He is an academic economist, uh, which is, I don't want to say it's never happened, but it is, it's extremely odd that someone who is legitimately a professor of economics, he's got peer-reviewed publications, he teaches economics, he's a professor of economics, uh, in in an Argent, you know at an Argentina u- u- university, uh, being elected president. It's also interesting for him to go give a political speech that is just um, you know saturated with the kinds of things that academic economists talk about, and he talks about them in a way that academic economists talk about them. So this was an incredibly unique speech. Uh, that he gave to the World Economic Forum. And it's very, very interesting. So um, I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of get on tape and pull out some of the, you know, some listener might be interested in in, in sort of uh, talking about the the hardcore economics uh, that existed in, in this individual speech. So before we get into that, let's back up. What is the World Economic Forum and, and why is it interesting or important? The, the the World Economic Forum is 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 a group that has met for, and it's gone through a couple of, Different names and 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 uh, uh, such in, in the past, but the, the the World Economic Forum, as I understand it, is is a is a group uh, that meets frequently to 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 talk about exactly how society should fit should fit together. So the World Economic Forum, at least, and and, and again, it's many things. But what's interesting about the World Economic Forum to me is that. It has some particular ideas about roles, the role of business should take in society, and it's it's antithesis. Uh, it's the antithesis to what like a Milton Friedman would think in terms of what the role of, of business should be. So, um, Milton Friedman is extremely famous for many things, uh, but in this context, Milton Friedman thinks that. A business basically should be beholden to its shareholders. So, under a under a Friedman view, uh, a business say they make widgets doesn't make any difference what they make. They should be primarily focused on making the best widgets that they can, and uh, they know that they're making the best widgets that they can in the best way that they can based on their based on their profit. So, the profit motive that economics is famous for was best fleshed out by Friedman's ideas and Friedman's and Friedman's writings. So uh, if a business is profitable, it's good. Uh, if a business is not profitable, then it's bad. And the only dimension um, that we can judge that on uh, objectively is the profitability of, of the business. Of course, that leads into a lot of nuance, that leads into a lot of details, uh, things like, well, what do you have to do to be profitable? Well, you have to make a product that customers want. It has to be sold um, at a price that customers are willing to pay, uh, that customers can afford. Um, you can get even deeper into that idea um, and 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 think about things like, well, a business is going to have to be responsive to its workers. So if a business is going to be profitable, it's going to have to be in an environment in which its workers can be productive, and it's going to have to attract workers. So a business has to attract good good shareholders to invest their money. It's going to have to attract good workers, um, you know, to come in and actually do the business of 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 of, of the company. So 
the, 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 the stakeholders of a business in a broad sense uh, in Friedman's world would be the shareholders, the owners, uh, the workers, and the, and the consumers. So a business that sells widgets or whatever uh, must respond to those groups. Those are the stakeholders in Friedman's world. Well, the, the economic forum economists have a, have a broader view of who the shareholders should be. So the economic, uh, World Economic Forum views um, that there are many other stakeholders. So society as a whole is a stakeholder. So a business is not only responsible to its owners, not only responsible to its uh, workers, not only responsible to its to its customers, but would also be uh, responsible uh, for 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 various other social activities and cultural activities. So. Um, that is, uh, is, is basically why it exists, and every year they go and they talk about those kinds of things. So the World Economic Forum is famous for thinking like, well, um, a, a company should be environmentally friendly, basically. So a, a company basically has certain ecological goals that it should fulfill. A company should, should make sure that its product is socially responsible beyond just satisfying its, satisfying its, its, its customers. So you've got the world economic view sort of opposed to the, to the, to the, to the Friedmanite view. If I could have Milton Friedman on the podcast, and then I said, what do you think of the notion that the stakeholders that a business have are much wider than sort of the classic Friedman view and then sort of pressed on that point of you, surely you can see how a business would um, you know, have this potential to do damage to like the environment and then none of their stakeholders sort of directly care about that Ta-da, there's a problem. What what might Friedman respond in that case? Well, I mean, far be for me to speak to Friedman, but I'll tr- Friedman, but I'll try. So I, I think the you know if I was going to channel him, um, I, I think one of Friedman's concerns that he would have from this view of like stakeholder capitalism, which might be sort of a generic term for what the World Economic Forum. Uh, would would call this. I don't want to speak for them either, but um, you know, call it stakeholder capitalism. Is is that when you're focused solely on profits and the um, um, the things that are very very closely related to the profitability of 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 the company, then the company becomes supremely focused on just on just that, um, and and they because they are focused on those things. Um, those stakeholders and the company have a very, very tight sort of relationship. So there's feedback there. So if customers stop liking the company's product, the company will know and respond accordingly. If, if, it, if a company becomes a very, very poor place to work, the company will know immediately because it will have a hard time retaining and attracting uh, and attracting workers. If the company loses its profitability, then shareholders will flee. So the managers or the owners of the, the managers would be the better word in this context, the managers of the firm um, will very, very quickly be able to assess and respond what the problem is at, at, at that point. And so in a Friedman's world, that's what makes a firm such a good thing because it's got an incentive to basically respond to all of these different different stakeholders in a way that at the end of the day makes the product excellent. Okay, given all of the you know conditions in which it's it's which it's made, when when you broaden the goals of a company beyond those simple things, then those feedback loops become very 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 muddled. So what what exactly does it mean for a company to be socially responsible in terms of its environmental environmental behavior? And it's not that we can't define those things, but all of a sudden it becomes extremely muddled. Um, and it, it becomes extremely subject to the subjective opinions of all of the pe- of all of the people involved, and the individuals or the groups that have input 
into those decisions of, of the company suddenly don't have a real stake in it anymore. So if I'm not a worker, an owner, or a customer of a company, and I go say, oh, well, you should be doing this, what's the, you know, there's, there's really nothing there. Uh, there's no basis for me to make those kinds of, uh, of of statements or those kinds of demands to a uh, uh, to a company. If if I'm a customer of a company, then it's like, hey, I, this is what I want, uh, and if you don't give it to me, then I will take my business somewhere somewhere else. Uh, that rep that's a real signal from me to them, because. Uh, it's it's got certain obligations on me, and it sort of imposes certain obligations on the on the company on the company itself, and it's 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 real. Uh, but if I just you know if 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 I just go tell a company, well, you should recycle more, I'm not really exactly sure that that means very much. And uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm not saying that environmental goals and recycling or anything else that we might say in these contexts, I'm not saying they're bad cultural goals. The question is that would put. Uh, sort of the Friedmanites in the World Economic Forum in, in opposition with one another is is our businesses under these kinds of mechanisms the best way for society to achieve those goals? So let me say this another way and see if you like it. So uh, what Friedman is saying is a firm is a good way, a good institution for doing very specific things which is producing and cost minimizing a particular product or service targeting a particular customer group. And they'd be very bad at doing things that are outside that purview. And if somebody comes from outside of that mechanism, like you're saying, a non-customer, the firm doesn't have any way to evaluate either side sort of of the problem. Is this a is this a good goal or target for us to be pursuing? And and having no way to sort of weigh the costs and benefits against each other because it's outside of, of that commerce mechanism. Yeah, that's an exact precise statement of uh, what I think Fried, uh, what I think Milton Friedman would Friedman would say. You so know, one, one of the many problems that Friedman would have with the World Economic Forum's ideas. Okay, so let, let's turn back then. You're saying now Malay is an example of somebody who n- not just would have read Friedman, but, but would have been academically trained by the field in a way that would be influenced by Friedman's thought. Yes. Okay, so it's interesting then that the World Economic Forum would basically say we come from this stakeholder perspective and we're going to have somebody come and speak that would be from i mean you called it antithesis so you know quite an opposite position uh, so what is it that that malay goes on to say in this speech that makes it sort of so interesting to us in that context i, I think i mean M- malay's speech was 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 remarkable for the for the reasons i gave a few minutes ago it's also kind of remarkable that he was invited to speak at this group because they had to have a pretty good idea of what of what he would say um, in, in that, and, and basically, if 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 I was going to, you know, encapsulate Malay's, you know, twenty minute speech or whatever, however long it was, into a single in, in, into a single word, is that Malay's I think thesis point was, it it is very very dangerous, okay, it is very very dangerous to make firms agents of the political process, all right, so you don't want to use the firm structure. All right. You don't want to use the commercial structure that firms exist um, to to achieve political goals that are outside the firm's responsibility to produce and distribute goods and services at at, at prices that customers want to want want, want to want to uh, want to pay. So um, that that is generally not what the World Economic Forum thinks. The World Economic Forum thinks that, that that firms should be agents of the political process, in addition to their into their responsibilities in in the market process. So, you know, his 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 speech basically starts out by explaining the difference between that kind of centralized economic system versus what economists would call a decentralized economy or a decentralized, um, you know, decentralized market system for you know for 
to, to make commercial decisions. So it's interesting, right? Because I think your average listener would would think there's a sense in which a political system, you know, it touches so many places. I mean, some people might even say basically all the places of your life in terms of being able to regulate and legislate. And a, and a, a market, an economy, com- commercial activity that falls under that. And I don't think economists would say, no, that, you know, it should be completely separate from the political system. So with that in mind, how do you, how do you define what's centralized versus what's decentralized since sort of neither camp is really going to argue for an anarchy type of situation? Right. And it's, it's, uh, you know, neither, um, Neither of these views represent pure pure anarchy. So I've had uh, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that Malay is an anarch capitalist, and I'm not really exactly sure what that term means. But uh, I do know that he doesn't advocate no government at at all. Uh, but a, a a decentralized economy would be one where businesses and households basically um, are tasked um, to satisfy their own ends okay so or to try to satisfy their 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 own ends so in a decentralized economy um you know a, a person or a group of a group of people you might even call them a group of investors um w- w- would be free to form an association um and 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 try to you know buy or sell basically whatever they whatever they want to sell so um, you know, if you and I want to go try to start a, a fast food restaurant here in Canyon, then then we're we're free to do that. Uh, we don't need any permission from anyone to do so. If we can come up with the uh, with with the money uh, to buy the equipment and hire the workers and get the you know if we're doing a franchise, get the franchise agreement and all, all that, uh, we're we're free to do that. Uh, under, under a centralized under a centralized economic system, we we wouldn't be free to do that. So in other words, the political process would basically have to say, yeah, you know, Canyon actually could use uh, another place for people to go buy, you know, chicken sandwiches or, you know, tacos or whatever, uh, whatever it is that, that, that we were that we were looking looking to sell. So it would involve a lot of permission and a lot of coordination with whatever the political process was. Um, you know, under some instances, maybe the people in Canyon might vote on uh, whether or not we want a restaurant, maybe vote on what kind of restaurant that we were that we were going to have. So that in, in a nutshell, that's the difference between a, a centralized economy and a decentralized economy. And just to sort of summarize that, in a centralized economy, you have economic or commercial decisions that flow extensively through the political process. In a decentralized economy, uh, in a decentralized economic system, um, on the other hand, you have these kinds of commercial decisions made by households and made by firms. They they flow through purely market mechanisms, um, and you know Malay's speech uh, basically thinks that the you know the the you know centralized economies uh, have been the root of all of Argentina's economic economic problems. Um, it's why he ran for president. Um, the people of Argentina apparently bought his case, and, and they must too think that because uh, I don't really think he ran on much else. Um, um, you know, they they too thought uh, that Argentina's economic problems, which are extensive and are longstanding, uh, were the result of their various flirtations with centralized economies and and the ideas behind flowing, um, uh, you know, making economic decisions flow through the flow through the political process. So, um, you know, in his speech, he gave lots of facts and figures um, um, in support of what he thought. So in 1860s, um, you know, which is a very long time ago, uh, he said that uh, Argentina was a world power. Um, you know, in the last generation or so, uh, it's it's become not a world power. So he, he actually says that uh, um, you know Argentina is 140th among all the nations in the world. He in his speech he didn't say 140th in what, uh, but you know certainly going from a world power to 140th is is not is not good. And and he very very starkly and very very you know clearly uh, blames collectivism uh, for Argentina losing so much ground 
to, uh, relatively speaking, to the to the rest of the world. There's a there's a sense in which there's not a, a really clean bifurcation between what's decentralized and what's centralized. You could have all the, you could say okay all the way over here on the decentralized end, there's what you said you know anarcho capitalism Rothbardian kind of the the political process is able to have no say whatsoever in that kind of uh, area of society, right? The, the, the interactivity of trade and commerce. And on the other end, you might have fully deterministic, the government actually owns and operates all the means of production. And then you can't have everywhere in between, right? Where we live in a society where you and I could absolutely go and put our money together and open a business, but we're going to have to get a license to do that. You know, so that's, that's some boundaries on what it is we can, we can do and not do. And, uh, you know, there would be certain types of businesses, uh, for all manner of reasons, you know, you're not going to be able to just go and open a facility where you make nuclear weapons or something. Let me pick up certain things, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, and again, but that's that's an interesting point. Um, you know, a system doesn't have it to be purely decentralized for it to be called decentralized because, uh, you know, as you say, th- there are licenses and permissions that you have to get from various government agencies. So you can't, you know, build a house without a permit to build a house. You can't build a building to put a business without a permit for that. Um, you know, if you make profits or an income, you have to pay taxes on that. When you go buy something, you have to pay taxes on that and, and et cetera. But none of those things, um, in the United States at least, none of those things anywhere near reaches a threshold where I would say that the United States doesn't have a decentralized economy. Uh, the, you know, in the United States, there are, you know, 350 or whatever million of us uh, that, that, that live here, of course there's going to be some kind of coordination among that many people using something that we would call a political process. That doesn't mean that we live in a de- – that doesn't mean that we live in a centralized economy. So, um, you know, the people that think that, um, um, you know, one single thing that you have to go to the government for permission for, one single thing that the government uh, won't let you do means that we're – you know, living in a centralized, I, I don't buy into that kind of thing. So the United States does have a free market economy. We are free um, to do a vast number of things. Um, and certainly we are free within sort of the bounds of what the political process allows us to do. The political process in the United States does put some bumpers on us. All right. So, uh, you know, in other words, we can't set up a shop to sell cocaine openly. Uh, in, in, in the United States. You can't, you cannot do that. And so there are some commercial activities uh, that the political process has said, no, you you can't do that. And you do have to get permits for buildings and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that's oftentimes very, very innocent uh, ways that society have, has decided that we're all going to coordinate our activities uh, with one another, not through the end result of commerce, but, you know, we got to have water hookups and stuff like that. So, um, um there is some degree of, of, of planning that the political process can undertake, which, which doesn't nullify the fact that we live in a, de- in a decentralized economy. But uh, I don't think it's that way in Argentina, at yeah, least according to Malay. That's kind of where I was going is, you know, the idea isn't you're either on, off switch, decentralized, centralized. You sort of have this spectrum where you go from more decentralized to more centralized and sort of as you slide further towards centralized you know you're going to have more and more economic ramifications right and so um, i'm blanking on the name but there's a uh, a think tank that produces like the economic freedom indices right and you know so they're looking at on, on some spectrum they're looking at comparing relatively free countries on the number of regulations that'll stand between you and making a business and on the margin the more of those you have the the less economic activity and innovation and all the things we would like to have our economy be doing the less of that you will have and then as you start sliding towards more and more centralized you have less and less of that and okay we could spend a lot of time sort of arguing about the different relationships there but sort of malay's case is you know, Argentina has been on the centralized side, and as it has seen more and more centralized activity, it suffered in terms of its economic output. Yeah, not not by name, but Malay mentions that index, 
and um, he he gives some data. His his speech is also very data rich, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you don't see that much for, from world leaders uh, to give the kind of, of of data that an academic might might give. Um, um, in a, in in a in what amounted to be a political speech, uh, at at the end of the day, but uh, you know countries that rank higher on the economic freedom scale um, have much less poverty, uh, starkly less poverty. There's a strong relationship between the amount of both poverty and abject poverty uh, that are in a society, uh, and and sort of a country's rank on these various economic freedom indexes that sort of um, are proxies for the centralized decentralized. Uh, economic, um, you know, e- economy scale. Um, f- people in freer societies live longer. Uh, was another thing that that that, that he mentions, and and it it is it is remarkable. All right, how strongly the correlations are uh, when you put all of these indexes um, for human flourishing. Things like how much poverty there is, how long do you live, would be the ultimate in human flourishing. Uh, and the economic freedom indexes that these places have, uh, that, that these think tanks uh, basically basically produce. One of the things that struck me when you you sent this to me, I ended up watching the the speech. You know, other than sort of a similar reaction to what you said, and be like, this sounds like the sort of speech that I would give were I a political leader, since I'm an economics professor. But you know, he gives a lot of sort of historical evidence he he says the things about collectivism and he 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 talks about centralized decentralized just you know straight out of what the field of econ would want you to approach these kind of things with uh, but but then he goes into kind of the classic cases for uh, why these things are important using historical evidence sort of broader than just Argentina's case can can you talk to us about that a little bit yeah when when you look at the when you look at broad strokes of world economic history over vast periods of time. It is astonishing what you see. And I think that a lot of people who haven't looked at the, haven't looked at the data, um, I, I think without exception, when people see this data for the first time, it astonishes them. And so I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use uh, Malay's figures in here. Uh, I'm going to assume that they're correct. Uh, but there, there may be Ways of measuring this that are different from Malay, but this 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 certainly, uh, you know, they might not be correct down to the decimal of, of what the real stuff is, but it's certainly um, uh, representative of, of what's going on. If if you look at economic growth, which would be a measure of the material status and choice of the average human being living on on the planet from the year zero which is what Malay uses up to the world, uh, sorry, up to, up to the year 1800, growth averaged 0.02% a year. Uh, th- so basically no growth. So when you go from, uh, you know, when you go from the, 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 from year zero to 1800, you had the average material condition of humans didn't change hardly at all. And what makes that so remarkable to me and what makes that so surprising to me the first time I saw that is that I know that there was like tech, tech, technology advance from the year zero to the year 1800. So it's not like the tools that people had at their disposal in 1600. Uh, they were different than the tools that people had in the year 200 ac- across, ac- across the world. So you, you think there were many advances in shipping and in transportation in engineering and agriculture, uh, during you know during during this time, the the printing press was invented um, hundreds of years before 1800. But these technological advances they did not produce economic growth in a way that made the average person living in the world during that vast swath of time any better at one point during that time than other points during that time. It is remarkable to me, and it would be remarkable to anybody that saw that. But in 1800, things started happening. Okay, so from 1800, um, in the 1800, so in the, uh, um, in, 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 the, in the 19th century, growth um, was about 0.66%. All right, so growth accelerated during the 19th century. So during the 19th century, approximately, the per capita income in the world doubled. 
Okay, so it didn't move at all before 1800 to the dawn of human history. And in that hundred years, incomes doubled. All right, starting from at 1900 to 1950, growth was about 1.66% a year. So during the first 50 years of the 20th century, incomes on average almost doubled again, approximately doubled again. Then from 1950 to 2000, growth was 2.1%. Uh, so far in the 21st century, growth in the world is about 3% a year. Okay, so by every measure, uh, the Industrial Revolution was an economic success. What happened around 1800 would be the natural question. So not only did we have this technological explosion, but it also happened on uh, uh, the backdrop of what we call the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution was a technical ex technology explosion. That is absolutely um, uh, unquestionable. So if someone you know, learned in a history class or whatever that the Industrial Revolution uh, was caused by, you know, the steam engine or whatever, you know, cotton, whatever might have, uh, whatever might have happened. That's that's true. But the world had had technological innovation before. Okay, the world had had new ways of doing things, new ways of communicating, new ways of transporting stuff uh, before 1800. But something was unique about what we call the Industrial Revolution that were able to translate that was able to translate these technical innovations into things that produce economic growth for the average person living in the world. And and that was this new way of organizing people, new ways of coordinating people um, in the act of doing economic activity. And so Malay calls this capitalism. Basically, so the Industrial Revolution did represent a technological acceleration, all right, that human beings uh, experienced. But it also was rep it also was a period where where human beings found new ways to coordinate their activities with one another, found new ways to trade, new ways to organize in production and consumption and transportation and all and all of those other things. So. As that form starting 1800-ish or so, you know, using Malay's timeline, that's when growth really, really started to explode. So, uh, you know, according to Malay, by every measure, industrial revol the Industrial Revolution was, a, was, was an economic success. Incomes since 1800 have increased by 15 times, all right, and 90 percent of an exploding population was lifted out of poverty. When you go back to 1800, approximately 95% of human beings that lived in 1800 lived in, in what would be considered extreme poverty. 5% didn't. Today, it's approximately 5% of people live in extreme poverty, and 95% of the people on this earth don't. So that happened, and at the same time, there are many, many, many times more people on the planet right now. So the Industrial Revolution and the tools that humans learned, both in engineering and science and in human organization, okay, all of those tools fit together in a way that has lifted almost everyone out of poverty at a time when there are more everyones, all right? So there's a lot more people now than there was, uh, you know, 200, 225 years ago. And, and it, is, it is extraordinary, all right, it's extraordinary. And so Malay states that the evidence that capitalism lifts people out of poverty is unquestionable, is the, is the, is the, word, um, is, is the word that he used. I, I'm interested in that because I think most people's reaction, if you said, you know, what causes economic growth would be a, a fixation on technology. And economists don't really disagree with this in any sort of sense. Like it's in all of our models whenever we're trying to model how an economy grows. We certainly agree that that is a factor. But in terms of this kind of regime change that you're discussing here, and I shouldn't use that word in, in a podcast because to you and me that would be a normal – I don't mean regime change in a political sense. I mean mm -hmm. just this very large shift in the way that economies organize and then therefore the results of that. It, it obviously can't be technology that was the fundamental shift. And you, I think, made an excellent case about historically why that would be the case. There's all these – there's all of these – technological changes that lead up to that. And then, you know, we have 
engines and steam engines and so on and so forth and 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 railways and things like this that all happened in the 1800s and so a history professor might say well those were just those are the ones that really matter like the the road and the wheel and 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 crop rotation or whatever those kind of things that happened before that it turns out they weren't just relatively weren't that important the problem with that explanation would be right and what about flight and computing and artificial intelligence all these things that technologically seem like they would dwarf the things that happened in the industrial revolution and yet no economist would characterize anything since 1800 as sort of a second industrial revolution that then put us on a completely different path right because you you quoted a lot of important and interesting numbers but like we could easily imagine a hypothetical change where instead of doubling the income over 100 years it increased tenfold so if if it were technological changes and it weren't computing and, and flight what could possibly cause us to, to sort of have a second industrial revolution that put us on a completely new path of growth um i'd say i'd say you you, you almost have to go to something other than technology not only because of the case that you presented, but also because of, of the case of what does technological growth look like since the Industrial Revolution? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's an extremely good point. So now we're on this growth path, but nothing has happened in the last 200 years that has put us on a third growth path. Right. Basically, which is the, which is the point that you're making. So the, the, the social organization uh, that Malay calls capitalism, that's what happened. And different economists have different theories about what caused that to, to happen. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're economists that just say, well, it's just, it is just simple technology. Uh, I, I personally find that explanation to be extremely insufficient. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what was it uh, that was special about the new ways of human organization? So, you know, let's, let's take for granted that it wasn't just technology, uh, which because I think, I think Malay does – um, that you know, Malay makes that assumption that it had to be something other than technology that caused this explosion, and it's something that really hasn't been replicated in the last two hundred years. So it was like a single event um, or a single change in social organization that that, that that created the the not the new growth path, but the growth path just to begin with. Uh, the the third way would be the new growth path uh, if if we ever find something. Uh, if if we ever find some some something like that, so uh, Malay actually gives an answer to this. Okay, Malay actually gives an answer to this, and and Malay cites uh, a, a, a sort of an obscure author, um, you know, maybe not to economists, but uh, to people that haven't studied economics, you probably haven't heard of Israel Kirzner. Uh, so um, he 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 actually cites Israel Kirzner's ideas of 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 market discovery as being a process, and he credits this process of market discovery and market competition, which was written probably well, at least for the first time, by this economist from, you know, 100, 100 years ago or so, uh, named, named Israel, Israel Kirzner. And, and Kirzner thought that, that, that markets were a process and not, and, and not an end state. And, and, this, and, and this part of the speech, um, uh, Malay really gets into some pretty, pretty hardcore advanced economics. It's very, very specific to what we would call academic economics. So he's not talking business here. He's not talking just, just sort of generic social theory, but he's actually talking very, very advanced economics, the kind of stuff that we would, you know, that we would talk about uh, in, 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 in class. And, you know, given his audience, I guess that's not too surprising because a lot of people at the World Economic Forum, they're, they're going to be trained as economists. A lot of not necessarily academic economists in the audience, but there's going to be a lot of people who are extensively uh, well read uh, in 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 what we would call academic um, academic economics and, and Kirzner's idea is, is is basically this is that the, the the market is a discovery process and at the center of Kirzner's world is is what we would call entrepreneurs and we're not talking about entrepreneurship in the sense of you know somebody that just wants to open a chicken stand or something like that uh, Kirzner's idea of entrepreneurship would have been someone who actively seeks new ways of organizing human beings into production that will produce things that customers want to buy. All right, so an entrepreneur in Kirzner's sense, uh, an entrepreneur in Kirzner's sense would be someone not just who is a business person, but someone who is actively 
involved in finding not only new products, but new ways of organization. So a, a more modern person that would be well read, um, uh, that sort of expressed Kirshner's ideas would be like Peter Drucker, uh, the management professor, talks extensively about entrepreneurship. And Peter Drucker defines entrepreneurship in roughly the same way that Kirshner would, Kirshner would, would define it. So uh, Peter Drucker is one of my favorite non economist thinkers so he's um, you know he's he's a management guru and he would be one of the he would be one of the most um, widely read management management person uh, you know management management people in, in sort of management classes and, and the management discipline so so Malay says that the prosperity of the people is going to rest on the fact that entrepreneurs are able to go through this discovery process. And Malay says that the the state, all right. So he's you know he's outside of the anybody outside the United States when they say state, they're not talking about Texas, but they're talking about a federal political organization. So like Germany is a state, Argentina is a state, the United States is a state. So he's using the word state in sort of the European sense as opposed to the United States sense. So. Um, Malay says the state should not punish actors in the discovery process. And um, um, by extension, um, Malay would say that one of the, you know, w w one of the um, um, benefits of the centralized way of doing things, one of the hallmarks of the centralized economy, or sorry, decentralized economy, is that in a decentralized economy, you, you, you have... Um, an environment where people who want to engage in the discovery process are allowed to do so by the state. So this gets back to what we talked about, you know, 20 minutes ago or so about the United States. Even though we do have government rules, you've got to get licenses and pay taxes and stuff like that. Th th this might be a criteria for whether or not something is a decentralized economy or a centralized economy. In the United States, sure, we have to follow these rules and laws. A lot of them are great. Some of them aren't. We could debate that on a different podcast. Uh, but but none of those things, or few of those things, is a meaningful um, uh, impediment to someone participate in in product discovery. So if someone wants to invent a new product or invent a new way to organize people into the production process or try to figure out new ways to use old ideas, there's nothing in the United States that even remotely stops people from doing those kinds of activities. So if I were going to make a case for the United States or any economy being centralized or decentralized, I think that's the line of thought that I would go through to sort of to sort of determine that. Apparently in Argentina that is not the case. So um, Malay thinks Argentina is a centralized economy um, with what he considers to be collectivism uh, being sort of the rule of the day. So apparently people in Argentina are not free to engage in that discovery process. Now, since Malay thinks that that discovery process is the ultimate source of human prosperity, any nation that sort of interferes with that discovery process, interferes with ways of, of uh, you know, interferes with, with, with people finding new ways to organize the commercial uh, aspects of society, is going to miss out on the, on the prosperity. And so, you know, Malay's goal and Malay's message to the World Economic Forum is very, very clearly you know, whatever policies you advocate, uh, whatever ways that you think that corporations should have relationships with government and larger society, you must keep this discovery process or the ability for businesses large and small to engage in the discovery process intact. Because if you don't, all right, you will, you know, make the world fall back into poverty. So let me synthesize and see if you like the synthesis of it. So the discovery process is what has actually created prosperity. And the discovery process is the activity of entrepreneurs, you know, any, any economic actor that wants to sort of take this on, in producing new products or services or new ways to produce them. But the idea is things that we didn't know before. So, so it's not just honing the knife's edge, but it's, it's blazing a new trail. And if you're 
if you're decentralized, then sort of regardless of you know the the in the impediments to um, how many hoops you have to jump through to do that, it is possible to do it, and that yes. would be the demarcating line. Yes, between those two things. Yes, and so in in this situation, then it's that you're not saying sort of as the case that I made before, that there's some marginal impact to how much of that happens or not, but whether that sort of process is possible at all. Yes. Okay. Um, and so Malay's case, and, and I'd like you to comment on sort of how the field would, would broadly agree or disagree with this, is that it's not technological innovation, but it's the discovery process of, of which Technological innovation is a subset, I would argue. I don't think he says that exactly, uh, you know, because he's talking about the discovery process. And you and I have sort of reframed this in terms of we also want to kind of anticipate one objection, which would be what about technology, that that's the thing that really put us on this new growth path, that that put us on the, the second trend of the hockey stick there. Yes. Is that fair? Yep. I, I think that's I think that's entirely entirely fair. A very precise way of 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 um, describing the role of technology in this process would be that technology change is a is a is a necessary component uh, to economic growth, but is not sufficient for economic for economic growth. So, is Malay saying the state shouldn't punish people that are part of the discovery process? is important on the grounds that that is economic freedom or is it important because that will then lead us to economic growth and we'll end up in a better world because of that i you know again not speaking for malay i don't, I don't think you can really distinguish between those two things mm -hmm. so i i think that the empirical case for what malay is advocating in this speech is very very strong um but whether or not and if i understand your question correctly whether whether or not the the freedom is good as an end to itself, I don't think Malay addresses that. Uh, I don't think the I don't think Malay Malay addresses that. So is economic freedom good um, for its own sake uh, as sort of a morality, or is economic freedom good because we know that it leads to all of this prosperity, uh, which is an anabash good in and of its in and of itself? I'm, I'm not sure what Malay would say. Uh, about, uh, about that, he he doesn't mention it in this particular speech one one way one way or another. So you've right. You, let let's let's sort of tie the where we're at now back to the beginning. So the World Economic Forum says there's all these stakeholders and there's all these important things that are sort of outside what we would consider the normal purview of a firm's activity. And we've sort of talked about the what the Friedman response to that would be. Now we've sort of laid out what Malay's basic argument is and this idea of economic freedom, and then you've mentioned all the extraordinarily important markers, uh, you know, poverty, uh, quality of life, um, life expectation, right? All these things that Malay has talked about. And so is then the idea that the World Economic Forum is saying, right, but you're missing these other important things. And Malay is saying to them, you, you need to prioritize these things. Or is it sort of a, a, a process question where the World Economic Forum says, well, we think we can get to the best economic outcomes this way. And Malay is saying, no, look at history. This is the path that has led us to the best economic outcome. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, that's almost certainly true. The, the I mean, the, the 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 World Economic Forum, to the extent that it would degris, disagree with with Malay, it's it's a it's a legitimate disagreement. So I don't think the World Economic Forum thinks, yeah, Malay's right. This is the way for economic prosperity, but we're 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 not going to do that. So because we don't want economic prosperity, I, I don't I don't think that's what the World Economic Forum is is saying. We we've just got two approaches. Um, you know, to sort of get us into the future economically uh, with prosperity, you've got one vision that is the World Economic Forum, and then you've got Malay's vision, which is which is completely different in terms of what it thinks that the role of commerce, firms, and government should be. So, so let me let me see if I can uh, steel man the World Economic Forum position, and then. You can you can respond from the Malay position. 
so I hear you. These are all great arguments, you know, agree, economic growth, life expectancy, quality of life, those things all important. I agree with you exactly. The problem is you're omitting all these other important factors and worse and we as the economic forum economists are saying what about environmental damage and and the social things that we might care about and those are things that that we should make economic trade-offs and we should should hamper the dis the discovery process and we should be involved with what the outcomes are for for actors that are involved in the discovery process in order to attain these ends like the environment and so socially desirable goals. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly what the steel man position of the World Economic Forum would be, is is that, um, you know, be, because the stakeholders in this discovery process appear to be very, very limited, then obviously um, you are going to lose ground on these other goals that society think are important. So the World Economic Forum might say, yeah, we've done pretty well, but we can actually do better. Uh, we, can, we can actually do better because now we're going to consider, now we're going to bring the political process in on this, and we are going to consider all of these other factors. And so we are going to force these outcomes through the political process that the, the market or decentralized process has, has, has ignored for the past you know, 200 years or so. There's, you know, I'm steel manning the World Economic Forum, uh, which which goes against my very, um, I, I should call them Friedmanite, but uh, Kersnerian, uh, my my own uh, proclivities. There, there's a part of me that would say, one, I, I disagree that you would you would get those outcomes. I just fundamentally think if, if you're tinkering with, it, if you think you're gonna take the free market away from the process. You're going to kill the discovery process and then get the better outcomes. One, I would just disagree with that. I think you're, you're worst offenders in terms of um, what's happening in the environment, for example, are going to be the countries that are more centralized, not the ones that are less. Yeah. And, and now different, different economists, I think maybe um, Andrew McAfee might, might be the one that says stuff like this. Like maybe you have to go through a phase. Like maybe it's path dependent kind of thing. And again, discussion for another time. The other thing I would say is I don't think you're gonna do well on social outcome approaches by taking away freedom just just as a general approach to that. Like saying, we want better social outcomes so you you will be less free is just generally not a good idea. Uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. And so my, you know, if I were going to put myself on one side of this debate, I'm firmly in Malay, firmly in Friedman's camp, firmly, firmly in Kirchner's camp. I think all that stuff is true. Um, I, I do think that the, the, the you know, the, the capitalist social organization structure uh, would be, again, to use the math term, it is sufficient for economic growth. Um, I, th I, think if, I think if you have that, then, then the, 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 the technology needed to propel um, the, the material economic growth, that, that'll happen endogen, endogenously. So, uh, you know, that's another model of growth that economists, that economists have. So I, I, think, I think capitalism is sufficient for growth, period. Since we've full, full stop. Since we've mentioned Kirchner a couple of times, I, I, I do want to say why I think, and again, as you've said earlier on, this would be like things that academic economists would be really interested in, and maybe the rest of the world wouldn't find so interesting. Kirchner, I think, is important because his idea is it's the discovery process part that's important, not competition. So if you take micro 101 and then you go out into the world, like you said, not, not, not an academic economist, not a professor of economics, but somebody who's interfaced with econ, you're going to correctly learn the importance of competition. And your idea of competition is going to be basically that the market disciplines its actors. I can't just charge any price because somebody else will come in and undercut me on price, and then we're going to cost minimize, and that has good outcomes for being able to 
being able to uh, get people, you know, the most resources, the best bang for their buck kind of problem. And that's competition. That's important. But you and I would say that's second order, and that's because of Kirshner's work. And what and what Kirshner says is, it's actually this this process by which we go into uncharted territory, that discovery process, that's really the important thing. Um, so that's some. I guess it's not really an aside to what we're talking about here, but it's just I don't get too many cut opportunities to comment on Kirshner. What, what do you think about that yeah, assessment? I don't think Kirshner? it's a side to Malay's speech at all, because the, the, at, at this point, and we're kind of going chronologically through Malay's speech, at this point, Malay really, you know, a, as if he's not into the hardcore academic econ- a- economics at that point, he, he really shifts gears. And, you know, the next thing that he addresses in his speech is, is a massive criticism of what is known as neoclassical economic economic theory. And so so Malay thinks that it is the interpretation of neoclassical economic theory sort of in in, in contrast to what Kirzner would think, which is what your point was, um, that basically has given license to the world's government to have all of these interventions that punish and interfere with the discovery process itself. So at the foundation of the neoclassical economic theory is this competition. Um, and when I say competition, in, in, in this sense, I'm, I'm using the jargon of economics. So in the jargon of economics, competition is a, a, a situation where you have Good information, maybe complete information, but good information. You have you have many buyers, you have many you have many sellers, and according to neoclassical theory, if these conditions are met, then you will have economic efficiency. Well, the flip side of that is that if these conditions are not met, you have economic inefficiency, and you have a justification for what Malay calls government intervention. Not, not Malay, everyone calls uh, government, uh, government intervention. So if you don't have enough sellers and you have monopoly power, all right, well, then you have a, a justification for the government to come in and do something about the monopoly. If you have incomplete information, okay, if in a meaningful sense buyers and sellers have different amounts of information, then you have a justification for the government to come in and intervene in these situations. And in intervening in these situations, what, what Malay says and what I think Kirzner would say and what a bunch of economists sort of in the Friedmanite tradition might say uh, is, is that, 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 yeah, you're intervening, intervening in these and your intentions are good, but, but you're, you're, you're actually short-circuiting the discovery process. Because if there is monopoly in the economy, um, if you just look at the math that you might learn in an intermediate micro course, well, yeah, you could mathematically prove that, that, that that's bad, uh, that the equilibrium that you reach in terms of price and quantity for goods is, is not the best one, and you can reach a better one. Well, how do you do that? Well, the government passes this tax or does this antitrust or... Um, you know, sort of regulates this market in one in, in, in one way or another, and you reach a better price quantity equilibrium than you had under the, the the one with the monopoly power. But if if you view competition not as an end state, like neoclassical economics does, if you look at it as a process, like the more Kirzner type tradition does, then you realize that that monopoly is basically an entrepreneurial opportunity. On one hand, a monopoly also might be the result of extreme entrepreneurial success. All right, so why would a firm get to the point where they have tremendous market power? Well, it's because maybe they are serving the customer best, right? So maybe you have one firm or a few firms that dominate the market, all right, not because of some, you know, problem in the marketplace. Not because of um, you know the other things that might lead that might lead to a, a concentration of sellers, but maybe you have it because the best firms have basically won, and um, um, you know customers in that market are being 
served. Uh, if the firm is making monopoly profits, then that's an opportunity for somebody to come along and do it better. And so it's it's within those monopolies. It's it's within not the equilibrium situation, but it's it's within the the disequilibrium situation that exists in markets. Again, according to the Kersner tradition, that create these entrepreneurial opportunities, and without those, we're not going to progress. Okay, so if in a static sense we ever reach a point where everything's perfect, well, then the, you you don't have any you don't have any reason to change at that point. So another way of looking at entrepreneurship under uh, uh, under the, the Kirshner tradition is that entrepreneurs are the are the individuals who who are constantly looking uh, for new processes and new products, uh, not for their own sake, but but for profit opportunities. So these profit opportunities exist in, in dynamic and imperfect markets, not perfect competition, but imperfect competition um, uh, as, as, as representations of profit opportunities that entrepreneurs will come along and, and, and exploit. So when you look at various market failures, uh, which in the neoclassical tradition would basically be any deviation at all from the assumptions of the model of perfect competition that everybody who's had a principles or intermediate micro class have, has has learned uh, uh, very very you know very very well. If you've got any deviation from that, if you've got public goods, if you have monopoly, if you have um, um, externalities, whether positive or negative, uh, someone studying the neoclassical model will look at those situations and say, well, these are all opportunities uh, for some sort of collective or government or political process to make improvements on the state of society. The, the Kirshner tradition will say, well, not so fast, all right, not, not, not so fast, and, and you know, market failures um, uh, in Kirshner's tradition, and Malay says this expressly in his speech, market failures don't exist. All right, because they can exist. Because what is called a market failure is actually a situation where a market has not yet materialized in the first place. So if you have an externality of pollution, that's not a, just just as an example. That's not a market failure, okay? But for whatever reason, institutionally, we've not had a situation yet where a market has developed to sort of internalize that externality. All right, to sort of inappropriately combine the language of neoclassical economics with what Kirzner might think about the situ situation. So that, that may be inappropriate. It may not be. Monopoly is the same way. So monopoly isn't an economic problem that needs to be corrected uh, as a market failure. Monopoly is just, is just a, 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 circum a temporary circumstance where, where a market to, quote, unquote, deal with the bad effects of the monopoly um, a market hasn't materialized to deal with that yet. So markets aren't static. Markets are dynamic. And so these problems, and, and again, I would put problems in air quotes here, the, 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 the problems uh, will be dealt with with market processes if we allow the discovery process, the market process, uh, to exist. So Malay just really takes... Uh, neoclassical economics to task because in his view neoclassical economics has been the justification for the kinds of centralized and political process interventions that short circuit the discovery process to begin with and he's very strong in these terms and and to listen to that kind of statements in a political speech i mean it's almost like he's given a, a speech to a bunch of economists and maybe he is maybe this is, it is called the world economic forum so so maybe it is a bunch of academic economists sitting in his office or sitting in his his audience and he's and he's speaking to them uh, but uh, again, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this in a podcast like this, because it's just really extraordinary political speech to have that much pure econo pure economics in it. So, um, um, you know, he wasn't talking about tax rates and stuff like that. You know, it's like, well, I'll lower your taxes and raise these other taxes. He's talking about deep divides and deep questions about the methodology of the economics profession, the economics discipline that you just don't see from from world leaders like ever. So I thought it was a very interesting, very interesting speech. I encourage everybody to go listen to it. 
My guest today has been Rex Pieski. Rex, thanks for joining us on the Econ Club. It's been, it's been great. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Econ Buff, where we find applications of economic thought in a variety of topics and fields. If you enjoyed today's discussion, be sure to check out our previous episodes on YouTube, Spotify, and Amazon Podcast under the title Econ Buff Podcast, and be sure to like and subscribe. For updates and information, visit our website at econbuffpodcast.wixsite.com. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us an email at econbuffpodcast at yahoo.com.